My name is Mark Warman. And I'm Tony D'Agostino from Tony's Mopar Parts. And you are watching a very special episode of Graveyard Cars. On this episode, we're going to fact check and verify two of the rarest Mopars on the planet. Starting with 1966 Hemi Charger factory four speed, one of only 250 built. But is this one of only 85 factory NASCAR program cars? We'll find out. Here we have our 1969 Dodge Daytona, one of 294 440 Magnum automatics produced. It's very original. Do we leave it alone or do we restore it? My name is Mark Warman. I've been restoring Chrysler muscle cars to OE condition for the past 30 years professionally, but I've been in love with them my entire life. We're the best in the industry, and we're just getting started. I'm Tony D'Agostino from Tony's Mopar Parts. I've been buying, selling, and remanufacturing Mopar parts for the past 30 plus years. The preservation and the documentation of the Chrysler muscle car is an art form. The importance of what we do cannot be understated. We make sure that the cars are correct. I have personally flown Tony D'Agostino out for this very special episode where we document, validate, and investigate some of the rarest and most desirable and valuable Chrysler muscle cars that exist today. First car up is our 1966 Dodge Charger 426 Hemi 4 speed. We're going to try to find out if Dodge offered this car in a NASCAR package. It's undeniably a beautiful car. From the minute it showed up here, I thought, even though I'm not like the 66 Charger fan, that first generation isn't my cup of tea. Where do you stand on them, truthfully? Like them, don't like them? They're okay. I don't, I'm not, I love it, hate it. It's just, it's okay. It's a little of that Marlin-ish look. And it's exactly. like, I think Dodge was just trying to find that spot, you know, with the fastback and everything. And obviously they perfected it in 68 because I don't think anybody's done better. But uh, looking at the car and just basing it on a quick visual walk around, it's a clean car. Very. Uh, I've looked at it a couple of times just glancing, and I think that it's probably been repainted once, because I don't think, number one, it'd be even physically possible with a car being out in the elements to have that much. No, I mean, look at the condition of the chrome, all the die casts. They were lacquer pitted. paint back in 66, so, yeah. or, a, or the early days of enamel. But this was garage capped. Yeah. You could but see look that. at the stainless steel, look at the moldings. It's a very good, clean, original car. Before we start looking at any of these cars, the very first thing we always do is read the VIN. The vehicle identification number. On a Chrysler, it tells you everything. So we want yep. to make sure that number one, it's a real live Hemi car. Right. Let Gotta make sure it's in it. Now you're we... not as good at the numbers as I am, but you go ahead and read that. I'll you give can, it a shot. But you can see better than me. Okay. XP29H6. That is a 426 Hemi. Yep, and H is the engine de designation in the uh, 66. Which I've it. never understood is such a perfect designation. They had it right the first year. Yeah, the very first year of the 426 Hemi. The street Hemi. The, in, huh? the street, the street Hemi. The yeah, sorry. First year of the street Hemi, uh, they used an H to designate. Did they do the same thing in the 64 race Hemis? It wasn't, uh, it wasn't in the VIN. Oh, the VIN only told you it was a oh, V8. Oh, that's right, it was pre. That's the VIN right. only told you if it was a V8 or a six cylinder calling the fifth digit of the VIN would be really easy. If you had to guess, if my daughter was out here asking her, what do you think the fifth digit, is? she'd probably guess H, because that makes sense. Right. But they didn't. In 68, they changed it to J, and in 70, they changed it to R. Why? Uh, Mark, I gotta get you there. 67, they changed it to J. 67? Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter, they changed it, that's the point. Well. Okay, this is more of that negativity thing. It's, it's, okay. it's facts, Mark. I can't okay. argue. Anyway, it's a factory four-speed car. Would you agree with that? That car, that interior is immaculate. I believe 100% that that interior is 100% original. Look at the patina. Look at the age. Look at the carpet. It's original carpet. I just checked. By the mohair on the back of it? Yeah, the yeah. yellow mohair yeah, yeah, instead of the gray. That looking stuff. Yep, it's original. And that smells like an old Mopar. But look at the condition of the dash. Yeah, and that's a. This, and this one's optioned with the factory rally gauge kit, which automatically tells you that it's um, a 426. Not Hemi, really. So. The rally gauges are standard on all Charger. The, the not the 150 mile an hour speedometer in the yes, jack. Yes. Yes. So, let's see. Okay. Why build two dashes? No, it was a special car. These were, these were really going to have the turbine engines in them. It was a high end car. It was a mid year car too. And it has these uh, quarter scoops. Which later got a little bit reversed and went onto the doors of the cars. You know yep, that yep, little on style the on the charger. 68. And these got put on the, the 67 Dodge Carnet quarter panels. Right. 
A lot of influence, it's funny to see things evolve. Exactly. The, the fastback top, they kept that in the 68, they just inset it a little bit. They tunneled it. Yeah, they tunneled Like the 66 and 7 well, uh, GM mid size cars. That, if you want to go with tunnel, you can do that. You know, you say tomato, I say tomato. We know it's a nice car, we know it's a Hemi car. Really, I guess it's here because the owner wants to be able to take it across the auction, the big dollar auction, you know the one I'm talking mm -hmm. about, and say, this is a factory, one of 85 NASCAR program cars. Have you heard of it? NASCAR no. program car. No, the only NASCAR program cars I'm aware of are the Daytonas and Superbirds. Mm -hmm. I never say never. But you don't I, say I, never I, with I'm Mopar. not, but I don't have a lot of confidence in it. Okay. This right next this to us. Spoiler, that's NASCAR only, right? That That is definitely a NASCAR inspired right. spoiler. Right, definitely NASCAR inspired. And believe it or not, this was, uh, these came with a handful of these first generation Hemi chargers only. It, was, it wasn't it was installed on the assembly line. It was installed at the dealership. It came with the car, but not installed at, on the assembly line. But it came in the trunk of the car. Yes, like the headers the on car. the D-Barracudas and stuff. Right, right, like the D-Darracudas, the headers were with the car. See, I didn't know that. Again, you're, you're a little sharper on this older stuff. This could have been just a Hemi car like that, that. would have had it. Well, I did say it like that. All Hemi cars would have came with this, at least in the trunk, or even optional in 66 and more mandatory in 67? Not, not all of them. It, it was limited. There weren't a lot of Hemi charges made, okay. you know, to start with. Right. And I think it came later on in the initial 66 offerings of the Hemi cars. 250, in case you're wondering, with a four-speed. Right. That, that's the kind of stuff that probably... The other things that struck me as total plausible NASCAR. Number one, I've got a book, pages from a book, excerpt, where this car, or one just like it was featured, and is branded as being a factory NASCAR. Right. Now, I'll just say that. I'll say that. The wheels definitely look like that NASCAR style wheel yes. back in the day. It's got the oval holes on it, right? It's the extra wide. That looks right. Look under the hood. Don't hold your judgment back, because I know you're just waiting to shoot me, shoot holes in it. Have you ever, ever seen that? Stay tuned, there's more of this awesome Hemi Charger coming up. We'll also introduce you to our Charger Daytona and a couple of super rare Mopars that we will be featuring in future seasons of Graveyard Cars. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Tony and I are scrutinizing this 1966 Hemi Charger to determine if it is a real one of only 85 factory NASCAR program cars. Look under the hood. Don't hold your judgment back because I know you're just waiting to shoot me, shoot holes in it. Have you ever, ever seen that? No, I haven't. I haven't seen it or heard of it. It is very, uh, it's, it draws the air from the cowl. Right, which yeah. is a low pressure where, where the NASCAR cars do. Mm -hmm. Now, the way how the NASCAR cars actually had it, because of course NASCAR cars didn't need to have windshield wipers. Tony's our guru on the NASCAR stuff. I got to say, he's sharp. He well, he lives back there, so he just he grew up around this stuff. They went the the air clean air assembly went straight back. Okay. It was a big opening right there. Okay, because they opening. didn't have wipers on NASCARs and right. stuff like that, right? And they drew directly from the cowl. Where this is. I guess you could say, if you want to believe it, on a street version, uh -huh. it would make the most sense to grab it from here, so that way you still could have the white. Yeah, functionally speaking, the theory is there. It may right. not be as, it's all the way out here waiting to get in, whereas if it was right, right. in the middle, it'd probably be cooler. But I thought that that definitely was inspired by the NASCAR Absolutely, type yeah. of mentality. The fuel line, I noticed, dumps out of the fuel pump and See into that. this right-hand apron. Take a look at that. That must have been somebody that must have been a pyromaniac. Because it doesn't make much sense. It, having it's a, in your hit corner, right? Yeah, having a fuel line in the open wheelhouse area. We'll raise it up in a minute and take a look, but yeah, it, it definitely goes out there, and I don't know if that's to avoid vapor locking. It must be, right? Well, Why else would you go outside the apron instead of the inside? Because the way Chrysler did it, they put it down on the bottom of the rail. It was perfectly fine. Right. These guys used a rubber hose, which is going to absorb the heat more so than the metal one, right? A lot safer if they're worried about vapor from the heat from the exhaust, would have been to run it along the top and then have it right. come back down again. Right. Here's one that I was gonna ask you. Look real close at that breather cap. I saw that when I was over there. That's, um, it's not a production street Hemi valve cover breather, but uh, that- Would have just been a chrome dome, right? Black and 66, chrome 67. Um, I know that because I make the valve cover breathers new. 
That's is. typical of what was used on a lot of the race Hemis, which of course a race Hemi NASCAR version was in the NASCAR cars. I've seen that valve cover breather commonly used on those applications. So that's, that's following suit. With, so it's an original the theme, NASCAR. With the theme. That's the bottom line. That, that right there is your smoking gun. That, oh. well, I think that'll probably fit on a six cylinder value. Would that make that a NASCAR car? Well, no. You, see, this is where you, see I recognize your sarcasm. Okay, you're just saying because you can do that, you can put it on another car. All right. Correct. You're yep. great. That's great, Johnny Cochran. You're, you're the man, okay? But let me pose this one to you, Inspector Clouseau. Whoever put it on there didn't just randomly get it at the local Pet Boys, right? He knew it belonged on there. Right. How many guys would have known what NASCAR would have put on their cars? Nice. Did Buddy Baker put that on there? It was very easy to see what was on the cars back there. Okay. We're not, they weren't looking for a 50-year-old vehicle to reference, they were looking at brand new vehicles to reference, even if it was a brand new NASCAR race car. With the Mr. Norm's decal, didn't he keep track of those? So maybe there's paperwork to support something here too. If it was possible, sure. All right, can we raise it up on the rack? I'd like to take a look real quick, make sure the torque boxes are in place and just see if there's anything else that supports my idea that this is a one of 85 NASCAR program cars. Okay, let's check. In a future season of Graveyard Cars, you are gonna be introduced to this 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona. This is an original 440 car. This car has more originality than any wing car I've ever worked on, looked at, seen, or read about. This is truly a time capsule. You gotta keep in mind that they made 294 440 automatic Dodge Charger Daytonas. How many of them are still wearing their original paint? Whether it's checked or not checked, weathered or not weathered, how many are wearing their original paint? How many of them have the original paint on the spoilers? How many of them can you walk up to and say, this is mass manufacturing at its best and look at a decal where the decal is supposed to line up with this decal and they're literally three eighths of an inch apart and yet you cannot bring this deck lid forward to match and make those lines line up. That's mass production. That's what they were doing back in the 60s. People today say they were perfect. They weren't perfect. They weren't even close to perfect. I opened up the glove box. One of the coolest things I've ever seen in my entire life in one of these cars. This is an original bottle of V2 Hemi Orange touch-up paint. Invaluable. But when you take a look at the overall condition of this car, you realize that this is truly a time capsule. The driver's seat, while it is worn out and thread, threadbare, so I had to have some black duct tape on it, it's just like this one, it's all there, it's all complete, the original headrest, which did come on all Daytonas because headrests were introduced mid-year 1969, and this was built late in 69, so it should have headrests on it. So look forward to seeing this car in future seasons of Graveyard Cars. The coolest thing about this car, besides having original paint on it, besides having the second day tires, besides the fact that the car is so original with 43,000 miles, here's something you don't see at Graveyard Cars. Originally, Mopars had the interior door lock knob located at the rearmost edge of the inside of the door. What year did the manufacturer change this location due to an increase in theft? Was it 1967, 1968, 1969? The answer coming up after the break. Because of the obvious threat to untold numbers of citizens, this station will remain on the air day and night. So what year did Mopar change the location of the interior door lock knob due to the theft problem? The answer, 1969. Due to the original location of the lock knob, it was easy to be able to go in with a coat hanger and pull that knob up since it was located right where the quarter glass met the door glass. Another reason for the change, it was impossible to reach around comfortably and unlock the door knob from the driver's or passenger seat because it was so far back. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. All right, can we raise it up on the rack? I'd like to take a look real quick, make sure the torque boxes are in place and just see if there's anything else that supports my idea that this is a one of 85 NASCAR program cars. 
Okay, let's check. All right, so we've got the skid plate, which is the correct original one for the 426 Hemi, and it's, they call it a skid plate, and in a way that it is, but it actually blocks off the ability to hit that. It protects deep the deeper oil pan. Right, right. right. Uh, leaf spring, why is this one? This isn't a, uh, a 354 Dana leaf spring setup. This isn't the, the track pack setup. This has five leaves, I think. One, two, three, four. This is six, and this is supposed to be seven. It has two halves. And I believe we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is missing a half, or I really, I'm really thinking that these leaf springs may have been replaced, but they put the bottom leaf with the number on it. See, they have a part number that coincides, oh. you know, with the assembly number of the leaf. And uh, actually, the whole thing's wacky. I've never seen that before. Right. They don't use bolts to hold those together like that. They just use those clamps. Um, and all oh, those probably are an aftermarket, like a super stock type leaf, but they put that on there for the correctness of it. Uh, I make the, uh, the lower leaf springs for the B bodies and the E bodies with the heavy duty springs. With the stamp in with it, but the, not the rest with of the, the number. Just no, just display. the lower leaf, so that way you could buy a Smart. new aftermarket leaf. And I'm also uh, doing them for the AAR and TA challenges with that number. But I don't see anything that jumps out at me that looks like, with all those provisions under Nothing the hood, underneath. right? It was just Everything under here is more Mickey Mousey. So on the outside of the car and under the hood, what we've established is that the air cleaner is definitely a NASCAR looking or NASCAR inspired style air cleaner. Yes. That's been modified from its original factory. The ignition system is complete Mallory ignition system, which who knows if Mallory's the one that supplied NASCAR, that'll be your research on it. The air breather that goes on the valve cover on the driver's side definitely looks like one that they would have used back in the 64 and the 65 NASCAR race engines, correct? Yes. The radiator's right, but replaced in it's new. It's original. The yeah. fuel lines are driven out through the right-hand apron yeah. for whatever reason on it. It has 426 Hemi badges. It's a 426 Hemi car. None of that yeah. stuff is surprising. The Mr. Norm's decal back there, I know. You're going to do your research, reach out to a couple of guys. I'm going to do my research and figure out if I can get any more documentation on who wrote the article on the car. I've also got a letter into the Chrysler Historical Society to see if they can give us any information. We'll meet back on this one. And I know you're also buddies with uh, Ray Everham, NASCAR crew chief. Oh, Ray Everham. He's also a, oh, Do yeah, he's he's a, a big buddy. Dodge fan, too. Yeah. Why don't you check with him? It's a good call. Yeah. You just wanted to say Ray Everham on TV, like get connected or something. It's okay. It has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. In a future season of Graveyard Cars, you will be introduced to this extremely cool, unique, and mostly original 1970 Plymouth AA Arcuda. Now, I'll tell you what makes this car cooler than most of them. This was owned by the one original owner most of its life up until about two years ago. The car actually started life ivy green, EF8 ivy green, which is the same color Kimberly Cook's little 70 Barracuda convertible was. Now, he didn't like that color because it was a 70, so he wanted to paint it the EW1 Alpine white, which is what you see on here today. And the way he did it was, like we would have in the old days, he masked off the stripes, painted it white, and then pulled the masking tape off. Keep in mind, in 1970, the AA Arcuda, they made 2,724 of these cars. Of those, only 1,604 had the automatic transmission. Looking under the hood <clears throat> is the original numbers matching 340 six barrel powertrain. I mean, you right down to the original radiator, original air cleaner, air, air cleaner lid. The chrome valve covers are not supposed to be on there. Somebody's added those, but the rest of it, the Hemi orange that's on the engine, that's original. Original alternator, I will bet you money that's the date coded alternator. Uh, the original pulleys, original horns, battery tray, Power brake booster, master cylinder, three speed wipers, which is mandatory on all cold air induction cars on Chrysler with or without the rally dash. What isn't right underneath the hood is you notice it's all blacked out. I think that the reason you see that it's black underneath the hood is for the fact that it would have been too difficult to have painted it white like the outside of the car. And remember all engine compartments on Mopars in these years were painted body color. So they just opted to go with the black, the matte black to go with the tops of the fenders, the core support and the hood. That's my guess. But what happened, what tragedy happened, 
that I am going to be able to correct is that the original fender tag is missing. When they took it off to paint the engine compartment, which is so common with these Mopars because it was just two, number two Phillips screws, they lost that fender tag. I am going to be able to document the car, make sure of every option that's on it, every one that's not, and that's what's great about an original car like this, and then I'll have Dave Weiss assist me in getting a new fender tag made for it. Some of the things that made the AAR really cool, this is a fiberglass hood, this is cold air, comes in through this opening in the hood, and that goes down through the plenum here, offering the three two-barrel carburetors that are still intact to have cool air from the outside in. The AAR strobe stripes, they start out wide, they start getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until you finally get down to the Bishindo, which is the CUDA and the famous AAR USA flag. Bottom line is you're not gonna wanna miss any of the future episodes, any of the future seasons of Graveyard Cars. This is what our whole lot is full of. The rarest, most unique, best stories, best muscle cars the era had to offer. Graveyard Cars every single day puts history into reverse. They're coming to get you, Barbara. And now we're gonna check out our Dodge Daytona, one of 294 440 Magnum automatics. What we wanna know is should the car be restored or left alone? Okay, 69 Charger Daytona. This is your cup of tea, you own one of these. Yes, sir. Incidentally, Tony's Daytona won OE Gold two years ago, three years ago. Yes, it did, it also won Concourse the Elegance. So the question on this one, Tony, is we know it's rare, we know it's super valuable. Let me give you a quick background. This guy bought the car brand new in 1969. Original owner? Original owner car, okay. has had it his entire life, dated his wife in this car, because he bought it when he was in high school. They've been married 46 years, I think she said. This was a gift to him to have it sent out and have it restored. Oh wow, well that's cool. But I know that you're a negative person, and I know that by nature you like to find things wrong with everything when people are trying to have joy. And so I just want to make sure that I, I have your- I think I'm realistic, not negative. Wow. The question is, it's not a perfect mint condition survivor number one car, but how many are out there? How right. many, especially wing cars are? Yeah. So now, I think that it should be restored to OEM, correct, original, right down to every nut bolt, just like we do. What I want is your opinion on whether you think it should be done that way, and then we'll make the final decision before I call the cut. If customer. it's a good enough survivor, I'll, I'll pitch a fit and fight you to leave it alone. You okay. know why? As good as your restorations are, they're only original ones. I know. So here's where you know your stuff really, really well. This is a little bit different than the Superbird, correct? This is different than almost every other car. Okay. When this car left the assembly line, it was a 440. We learned that in previous episodes. It was a RT 440 car, whether it was four-speed or automatic. It right. was an XX29 car. So let's talk about this car leaving the assembly line. It was destined to be a Hemi Orange 69 Daytona Charger. That's what it was d designed as. That's that, what, that's it what its final was gonna end up. How it left the assembly line was a complete 69 Charger RT. Okay. Uh, without a bumper and grill. Okay. So it was painted, it went through the, the uh, it got baked through the paint booth and everything. It was all. So this is what I want to know then. When it went over to Creative Industries and it had the 70 Charger fenders put on it. Modified 70, char modified 70 Charger fenders. Modified 70 right. Charger fenders. And the 70 Charger hood. Right. <clears throat> and the fast top filled in back here with the plug. Yeah. And the shortened up deck lid. Mm -hmm. How much of the original factory paint should be left on this car? Okay the most that could be left, because think about it. The fender's hood and nose are painted. You did the whole thing. There's nowhere to stop on the roof once you do this, so you're painting the whole roof. They're painting the roof, they're painting the whole You have to do the deck lid. The whole uh, Dutchman it's got shortened area. Up. So the Which most is the quarter panels too, because there's nowhere to stop unless they no, did a reverse. They did re the most you could have original paint on a Daytona is the door and the side of the quarter panel. My understanding uh, from somebody uh, pretty knowledgeable on this stuff, was that the doors were the only things that were original paint. That's... Is that possible? Oh yeah, it's, I mean, but they've also, it was all over the board, there were 503 cars, it depends how the color came out, how it matched. You know, Maybe it was quicker to set up the door and just gun it, you know, than you to try to match it between two panels. Sometimes the whole panels. car was painted. Right. And, but you can see there's a picture of, uh, there's a, an old photograph of a number of cars on a car hall, all wing cars, yep, yep. getting dropped off after they were converted. 
and you could see the difference in sheen because yeah. the paintwork that was done was not done in a booth. No, it was done it out in the middle of the assembly shop and it was done in lacquer. It was hand, it? and yeah, by hand, by like hand. Not, not in a nice, you know, climate control million booth. million dollar right, control baked on. Yep. So it was, it was like a couple guys in the backyard almost. I just thought of another panel that could be, that wouldn't have needed to be touched, right? That's true. The cow the panel. Cal. And see, we got peeling paint down in there. Right. So is that factory peeling paint? That's doubtful, right? I've never seen factory paint peel like that. Job. But remember, this isn't typical factory paint. This right. Is this is spray. Hand shot lacquer. So it could be that this got sprayed and that's what's peeling back, but what's underneath it? It should be the orange paint underneath it. Right. It should be the paint. orange. Right. So my, my thought is, is that probably has all been repainted at some time. But look at the difference between the machine of the cowl on the door and the nose itself. Yeah. This will buff out, that's not the point, but it's just that that door looks like it's in good shape, but so does the quarter and so does the roof. Right, I, I know. It's... So maybe the car got popped at some point in its life too. I mean, I see, I don't know how far they went, but they would. I see paint see, on see? that fender this hideous. Right, hideous. and the Pentastar wouldn't have had paint because that would have been a new fender installed right. afterwards. Right. Coming up, Tony and I continue the examination of this ultra rare Dodge Charger Daytona and I will introduce you to another car coming soon to the GYC family. True or false? The right and left hand fender scoops on a Plymouth Superbird were actually shaped differently. The answer coming up after the break. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. So, were the fender scoops on the 1970 Plymouth Superbird shaped differently from side to side? The answer is true. Unlike the Dodge Daytona where they were the same because the tops of the fenders were relatively flat, the Superbird used a Dodge Coronet fender. This Dodge Coronet fender was shaped differently on the top surface which required a different rake from the left side to the right side on the fender scoops. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. In 1969, Dodge built 18,344 Dodge Charger RTs optioned with the 440 Magnum. Of that number, only 3,605 had the factory four-speed in it. Of that demographic, only a handful were built with the special edition trim package. In future episodes of Graveyard Cars, you will be introduced to this very rare very unique one owner Dodge Charger. Let me tell you what's cool about this car. The guy bought it brand new. It's still wearing its original T7 dark bronze poly paint. The engine is the original numbers matching 375 horsepower 440 Magnum. When you look under the hood, not only do you see the numbers matching original 440 Magnum, you see everything of the era that is correct. Yes, the upper radiator hose and the heater hoses have been replaced, but it has the original carburetor with the original tag on it, which is unique for a 440 and a four-speed. An automatic would have had a different part number on it. Somebody's changed the valve covers out, AMD makes brand new ones, that will be part of the restoration. Look around the rest of the engine compartment, the original windshield washer reservoir the original paint underneath the hood, the original bracket that held the heater hoses, the vacuum lines that are still wire tied together just like they did at the factory. This is a vast wealth of information and history that will be documented in future episodes and seasons of Graveyard Cars. Look at the fender tag. This thing reads like war and peace. There's a lot of options on that thing. When you look at the fender tag, you're gonna see all kinds of options from the AM radio, which believe it or not was actually an option, to the black vinyl top, to the black bumblebee stripe. This car is optioned with the A47 right there, SE package. That comes with a ton of options, including leather interior. The bottom line is you're not gonna to wanna to miss a minute of the next 10 years of graveyard cars, the next 20 seasons of graveyard cars, because this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we're building. We've got years of cars to restore. This is one of them. If you love Dodge, if you love real muscle, you're not gonna to wanna to miss a minute of graveyard cars. Everything up in here looks original to me. This, so much stuff on this car looks original, but I just think, I, I, I'm not leaning towards just leaving it alone though, because I'm not 100% I'm not sure it's the survivor quality. I know, we gotta look at it a little bit more. Um, see, one of the things I was talking about, and it's hard to say if it was done from a, another paint job past the, the original two paint jobs, 
but um, this is very typical to have paint on these, paint right? On, on the rubber hood. Bumpers. But like you say, if if we knew it was original paint, then that would be normal to see that on there. Right here. Yep. I, I mean, look, even even the worst of paint jobs, I think they would have masked this off better. Yeah. But I I, I really I truly feel that this is original. Uh huh. That that paint up on top of those is original. Well, and, if it was a brand new car, here. why wouldn't they wait to put those on there? Because they were already no, put on the assembly line. It was built. The car was a, except for a grill and a bumper. It was it, done. It was a hundred percent done car. You know, there's a lot of original originality about this car, OE original stuff. Oh, I agree. You know, a ton of stuff. I, I, I still am not convinced with the condition to, to go that far, but a couple things to make note of. This is an original battery cable. Okay. Uh, typical of the assembly line. This is your thing, because I, I can't ever tell the difference between the reproductions. Oh, it's very it's very common that the two, the colors of the, uh, the sheathing on the cables on the positive will be different. There'll be a different shade From of red. From the factory. Right. And OEPs. And the one telltale way how to confirm from there are some high quality reproduction cables out yeah. there today. Yeah. But the real ones have a little spine on them. Oh, a spine on that secondary that wire? No, both of them. You got to look for them and you got to clean the wires up. But that's how to tell with a little spine. Ah, uh, I feel it. A seam. Okay. How about that? Wait. I did not know that. Another thing that's 69. Uh, 440 high performance, which is different than 68 or 70, the dipstick handle is black. Oh, I thought somebody did that. It's no. supposed to be orange, I thought. In 70. In 70. Yeah. It's black in 69. 69 is black. Didn't and know that. in 69, the dipstick tube was next between the exhaust manifold and the valve cover, where on 70 it's it was sweeps, on the outside. Sweeps out, right. But we could tell this is a 70 uh, exhaust, exhaust manifold. manifold. Must been the replaced. Heat riser tube, yeah. Right, it has the bosses on it for the heat riser. So I mean, that's been replaced. Right. And they added electronic ignition. They added some creature features to it. There's your NASCAR air breather. That's small diameter. I know. <laughs> I'm just um, if you look at the broadcast sheet, I guarantee those are on the broadcast sheet. You guarantee it? Or, I guarantee it. Or are you just it. guessing? No, I guarantee it. I don't guarantee have to guess. It. Oh yeah, look how long they've been on there. Yeah. Look at look at the condition of the dash pad. When was the last time you saw a dash pad like that? Right. Look at the instrumentation on it. I mean, yeah, it's not perfect, but it wasn't perfect in the factory. Yeah, and those lower pads always get to be old. You know, screwed. I have a saying I like to use. They're only original once. So while you want to go bat dung and just berserk and start painting the Is car. Is that a saying you use? It's a saying I've, uh, I've, I've, I've heard somewhere before. Okay. Question is, with all the things that we've seen, do we, do I do my magic on the car? Buff it, snuff it, touch it up, replace, touch, dab, and try to preserve as much of the original integrity, or is it dilapidated enough and not worth enough in its original state that we do a full-blown restoration? So uh, you go do your homework, I'll go do mine, and we'll uh, reconvene. Sounds good. Now that we've done a visual inspection of both vehicles, we are going to take a break, go do our own research individually, and we will be back with a final conclusion on both cars. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened. Unburied dead are coming back to life. On our 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona, the question was, does the car get restored completely back to the way it was the day it left the assembly line because of its condition now. The second assembly line. Or, do, see that's why you, don't try to bogart out the mic. Or does it get a little fluff, a little buff, some touch up, fix some things that are worn out, fix some things that are incorrect on the car, and maybe live with it as a survivor? Right. Now this is a 1969 Charger Daytona 440 automatic. What two engine options did they have in the Daytona? Well, it was only one option. The standard engine was the 440 Magnum, 375 horse, and the only optional engine was the 426 Hemi. Which they made 70 of. 70 Hemis, yeah. Yeah, how many, how many four speeds? They made 22 four speeds out of the 70. Let's say that if we decide that car is a survivor car, and we're gonna touch up the nose cone on it, and, we're gonna, and we'll go through all those details, but that we could leave the car pretty darned original as it is now with some corrections, but mostly original. Mm -hmm. Would you expect to see the right buyer pay even more than the restored model? Yes, it'd have to be the right buyer. It's almost like an acquired taste, but those people appreciate the survivor and we pay a premium for that. There's, your, there's the hook right there. You're going to spend a ton of money restoring the car, and it may not be worth as much if you just did some minor details and repairs, if it's a candidate for that, right. with the right, with the right, right. owner. So Tony and I actually started out on 
opposite sides of the net in this particular case. Uh, I'm a restorer. And I want to leave stuff all original. A survivor is a car, it doesn't just mean that it's survived the past 45 years and hasn't hit the junkyard. It means that it's a car that's in very good condition. It does not need a restoration. It's, it's functional. It appears from 20 feet away or 10 feet away that it, the car is in excellent condition. It might have a little scratch or a little, a little wear and tear, but it's, it's been very well maintained and it doesn't need a restoration and it's very good appearing as it is. What I do is I bring the cars back. So I take the cars like that, completely disassemble it. I document everything so that I can emulate the original way it was put together. But I take these cars out, strip them right down to the bare bones, as you've seen. They get dipped, stripped. Every panel that needs replaced gets replaced. Then the body and paint is done. After that, the engine, the transmission, the drivetrain, the K-member suspension, interior, cooling, everything, interior, everything. everything on that car is completely restored back to what it should have looked like on the day it went down the assembly line. We're on total different sides of the net, and again, we flip-flopped a little bit. Yeah, yeah. initially I was thinking this, uh, this might be able to be fluffed and buffed and mm -hmm. come back to be a pretty presentable survivor. And I know initially you went into it, yep, ring up the register, we got another <laughs> restoration here, guys. It's not all about cash, but. And, um, well, you wanted to do your magic. I wanted to do my magic, yes. And once we started Blip, looking at correct. it more, while it is a very original car and it hasn't been modified, I mean, much to speak of. It's, I just don't feel the quality level of what's there is good enough to be uh, coined as a survivor. I don't feel the paint quality is good enough. Uh, the carpet's been changed. Not that that's the end of the world. The steering wheel's cracked. Um, the, the driver's seat is worn out. But I still just don't think that uh, its quality level is good enough to be left alone. I think you should do your restoration to it. At the end of it all, I could probably spend $5,000, my own time, my own person, Mark Warman, do the things that I think I need to do, and I think I could find a wallet that wants to open for that car as a survivor. That's my opinion of it. The nice thing is you could try it mm -hmm. and see how it looks, right. and then if it doesn't work out, just do the whole thing. You already needed so the seat, a little bit you of already needed the carpet, you already needed the steering wheel. Right, I think you could restore that car and keep a lot of the original components. Mm -hmm. In the overall picture, in the overall scope of the Daytona, the truth of the matter is the owners of the car want it restored. Okay. I've actually had this conversation with the, the okay. lady. The lady did it for her husband as a gift. They bought this car and he bought, the husband bought the car in 1969 when he was still in high school. That's so cool. That's amazing. Here's the difference, I think. You, and I didn't give you this, right? Okay, no. But you know where I'm going. He saw it he's brand seen, new. He's seen it brand new. He's owned the car and seen it like this for 40 years. Right. He's ready to see a different picture, a different mm -hmm. snapshot. So this one you're gonna do? This car is getting done? We're gonna done. restore the car, have it back to him in 24 months, and gonna be a really happy family. I think that's the right thing. So we got our 1966 Hemi Charger, four Correct. speed. One of 468, 426 Hemi's, one of? 254 speeds made. Okay. Definitely an original Hemi car, mm -hmm. no doubt. It's already rare. Right, it's already rare. It's what it is, the VIN number checks, body numbers, all the body identification is all there. It's, it's the real deal. The question is, is it one of the alleged 85 NASCAR street version Dodge dealer offered package car something along those lines that Correct. it's been represented, Correct. potentially represented as. Yes. I bounced this off a couple of wing car gurus and uh, the only thing they, ever, they came back to me with was this same car. Because this car has been in a couple publications. Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. um, I have copies of those. Right, and that's the only time that this could be documented as far as, and what we're talking about just to go back to it was, this car has that old Cal induction Hemi air cleaner mm -hmm. type deal that mm -hmm. draws the air from the low mm -hmm. pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got the slots, the white body color slots mm -hmm. on it. They're Very typical similar to a NASCAR right. wheel. Well, I did a little research of my own with certain people like Mr. Ray Evernham, a friend of mine. So I got him on my phone, I can just text him. Name dropper. That. No, no, I'm just pointing out a fact. But go on, plead the rest of your case. And tell me uh, what you think of that car and you tell me what your final opinion on that car is. Oh, I think I know where you're it's going. It's not an opinion, like... it's what I know. Okay. And, and what I know, that is just a really nice 66 Hemi Charger that somebody wanted to make it have the appearance of a NASCAR car 
and they added those wheels and they added that air cleaner, which does have ductwork going to the uh, cowl. I'm not gonna say that that wasn't some kind of air cleaner that may have been available in the aftermarket, mm -hmm. but it wasn't anything that was offered through Dodge mm -hmm. or any kind of Dodge dealer program. Okay, give me an example of documentation. Paperwork, uh, paperwork from the dealer. A book. No. That, no, not a book. No, not, not a book. Not a book. Not a that, written, published book. No, because there are many inaccuracies in many books, and those sure. and the book that you're referring to, that I believe you're referring the Charger to, book, right, is a not too old book. Mm -hmm. Okay, it wasn't made back in the day. It was something that was all of a sudden discovered. You need to have dealership paperwork, um, a notification from Dodge to the dealerships offering this package like I have for the Daytonas, sure. like they was issued sure. for the A12 cars. My point is, I don't think that we get the option of picking and choosing what validates the nomenclature that supports a cars. But somebody hand transcribed the VIN numbers. I've got a car here right now, a 1970 Plymouth Superbird, 444 speed car, lime green, right? Which is an FJ5 car, D21, E86 car. Mm -hmm. Okay, that car, is not in, technically, is not in the registry of the 1920 cars that were built. It is not in there. There is a VIN number in that registry that is almost exactly like it, but it's missing a character. Instead of the full 11 characters, it's because, missing a character. Because like you said, character. these were handwritten. Handwritten. So they are subject to right. human error. Right. Okay. But there is a list and there is documentation that the Plymouth did offer to Superbird, and here's the VIN list that had to be submitted to NASCAR for approval. Correct. There's evidence that Chrysler liked NASCAR and was involved in NASCAR. They built a Superbird, they built a Daytona Charger, mm -hmm. they built a 1969 early version of the XX29 Charger 500. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that, who's to say just a couple of years earlier they didn't put out some kind of a package like that? Things that are known are known. Things that aren't known, you really need backup proof on. No. As much as I want to believe it, I love oddball rare stuff. That, that's cool. Right. But prove it. So when I look at the evidence in total, when I look at the air cleaner, when I look at the aftermarket Mallory pieces, when I look at the, the fender well exit fuel system that obviously was engineered and designed for the car, when you're talking about a car that has... Engineered? By, engineered? Mm. By who? My turn or not. Anybody can rain on somebody's parade. It takes a handful of guys in the world mm. to be able to have the fortitude, the knowledge, and the optimism to be able to see... I think the word's gullibility. Cloud has a silver lining, all right? So, mm -hmm. my opinion, the car left Chrysler as a factory NASCAR program car. I will find out. Granted, the jury's still out. There's no absolute 100%. There's no 2,000%. But when there is, you'll be the... 5%. There's no percent. Okay. Your eyes just keep getting bigger, so I don't know what that is. I, is that an East Coast thing? It's my Nancy Pelosi thing. Well, it's insane. My point is, I think the car's real. No way. It's like you say... No way. No way. No way. I'll, right. I'm not a betting guy, but I bet... And let me just leave you with this thought. My Superbird, original car unrestored. What if I put an air cleaner like that on it and I put wheels like that on color key to my car? It's an old original car, it's an old original deal there. This is it, this was one of the, the special NASCAR Superbirds and then made. Get a, and then get a publisher to publish a world renowned book about world? it. It's just a picture book. Well, maybe it has pop-ups too. Right. Don't miss the next three episodes of Graveyard Cars. We will walk you through the complete restoration of our 1970 Dodge Challenger Plum Crazy six-pack car, as well as our FK5 Burn Orange 1970 ME Charger. Four speed. Yeah, it's just not important. Ah.